Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another episode of Crazy Money. This is your host, Paul Ollinger, but you knew that. Hey, it's a great day to be alive. Are you still aware of that? Are you still cognizant of the importance of each day during week six of lockdown? Week six. Wow, we made week six. Wow. You know, I'm doing okay. We're doing okay. I think, though, if we were at a restaurant... Not that any of us has been to a restaurant for five and a half weeks, but if we were, now's about the time I would nod at the waiter or waitress and just say, uh, check, please. No, this has been delightful. Great, great time. There's been some really positive parts of this, but I'm ready to move on to the next part of my life. You know, like maybe in the future, we'll revisit this restaurant. Maybe we'll have short-term quarantines where we just hunker down with the family and watch movies and do a lot of baking and eat a lot of meals together and catch up. But for now, I'm ready to move on. And I'm guessing many of you feel the same way. But if you're looking for some perspective, I've got a great guest for you today. Her name is Lori Gottlieb. She's a psychotherapist and author of the best-selling book, Maybe You Should Talk to Someone. It is an excellent read. She's had a fascinating professional and personal journey that she'll talk about. We'll also talk about what it's like to be a therapist, a therapist in therapy. And we'll talk about the resilience and emotional health all of us need to make it through the quarantine. And of course, we'll talk about money and how she sees it showing up in her sessions with her clients, especially with some of her most successful clients. Before I get to my chat with Lori, I want to say welcome. We have some new listeners. We had a nice little bump in the audience this past week. Very grateful for a little bit of the press, the public relations. We got there. The Atlanta Journal-Constitution featured crazy money on the front page of the lifestyle section last week. So thanks to Rodney Ho and his reporting there. And welcome to People who read the AJC, I found out who still gets a physical paper. (laughs) Congrats to you people for using email. I'm very impressed. Also, last week, we got some new listeners probably from the essay I published on Medium. The essay's title is, Your Only Goal is to Arrive to Survive the Quarantine. Change your metrics, not your clothes, your metrics. It's been read almost 200,000 times and counting 100,000 just yesterday, so we'll see. Anyway, if you're coming to us from that, welcome to Crazy Money. On this show, we talk about money and its connection to happiness and how having an intentional relationship and a clear understanding of what you want from money and material success will lead you to live a more meaningful and happy life. And we do that through the lenses of conversations with my guests who span the spectrum from celebrities and broadcasters and academics to everyday folks like my dad and my wife, who were two of my favorite interviews, by the way. So anyway, this is Crazy Money. Let's talk about Lori Gottlieb. Lori Gottlieb is a psychotherapist and author of the best-selling and excellent book, Maybe You Should Talk to Someone, which is being developed into a series for ABC television by Eva Longoria and 20th Century Fox. Lori, you might know, pens the weekly Dear Therapist column for The Atlantic. Her article, How to Land Your Kid in Therapy, is one of the most widely read pieces in the history, the storied history of The Atlantic. In addition to The Atlantic, her writing has been published in the New York Times, Washington Post, Los Angeles Times, Time, People, Slate, Salon, New York Magazine, Parents, Elle, Cosmopolitan, (gasps) Glamour, Self, Red Book, Town and Country, just to name several. Holy crap, she's prolific. She's a very interesting person. Please enjoy this conversation with Lori Gottlieb. When I was training, one of my clinical supervisors said, there's something likable in everyone. It's your job to find it. And I thought, Well, that's very nice, but (laughs) I don't imagine that I will find something likable in everyone because how can you? But she was right. And I'll tell you why. That if people take off the mask, you know, because the mask is like what John was doing, trying to keep me at bay with his not funny joke. If people show the truth of who they are, there is always something likable, something relatable, something that you can connect with. My name is Paul Ollinger. I'm a stand-up comedian with a background in the corporate world. I hit the lottery when I worked at a small company called Facebook. I'm fascinated with money, why we're so obsessed with it, and how it makes us happy or not. Welcome to Crazy Money. Lori Gottlieb, welcome to Crazy Money. Oh, thanks so much for having me. Lori, I read your book while on vacation a few weeks ago and was very much looking forward to talking to you. But since the time I finished the book, not only has the wider world exploded, but you've gone through a personal tragedy in the loss of your father. I'm so sorry for your loss. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. You know, I think we're in these very unusual circumstances and I've been 
really trying to focus on what I wrote about in the Atlantic called the both and Mm -hmm. meaning that we are in the middle of a very tragic circumstance. And at the same time, other things are happening in our lives too. And so, you know, my son was home, he's now doing remote learning. And I remember the first week that he was doing remote learning and I walked by his, what I will call his virtual classroom, i.e. his beanbag chair. And, (laughs) and I remember thinking, I am so happy to see him, even though the circumstances were terrible under which I was seeing him. And so I think that a lot of people are just sort of focusing on coronavirus all the time. And other things are happening too. You're playing games with your family members. You're connecting on FaceTime with your friends. You're reading a book. All of that is also happening. So, you know, when my father died, that was happening too. I think that it's important for us to recognize that there are many notes in the song. It's not just one note. Yeah. Are you able to find room to grieve during this crisis that we're in? Yeah, I am. I I think that many people are in my circumstance where somebody that they love has died unrelated to the coronavirus. And we had to make adjustments. We couldn't have a funeral the way we wanted to have it. We had a private burial. I'm Jewish and we normally sit Shiva for seven days, which means that you have your house filled with people coming over and bringing meals and sitting with you and hugging you, um, sharing memories. We couldn't have any of that. We'll have a, a memorial service whenever we're allowed to be around humans again. You know, so that was different. But I think people found other ways to connect with us. I think that one thing I'm seeing so much during this crisis is the resilience of the human spirit. You know, I'm seeing so much in terms of people being adaptable and flexible and finding ways to be human during a time where it feels like a lot of the things that make us human are not available to us. Would you mind sharing the story about being lonely during your freshman year of college and how your dad counseled you during that time? I'm from California and I was on the East Coast for college and it was freshman year and I was really having trouble adjusting. I think I was, I was feeling lonely. You know, everybody was wonderful at at the college that I was at, but for whatever reason, I I didn't love sort of the dreariness of the East Coast weather every day. Oh, that's a little unfair. Come on. (laughs) It was a big adjustment for me. You know, I like to be outside a lot. It was very hard to be outside. I I wasn't really liking the lifestyle back there. And, you know, maybe I was adjusting also an extended period for the first time. And he knew that I was I was really having trouble, not academically, just sort of finding my my way there. And I was really unhappy one weekend. And I said, you know, maybe I should leave. Maybe I should come back to California. And I just, I was in no state to really make a decision. And he said, you know what? I'm going to come out this weekend and we're going to hang out together. And and I want to hear more about this. And, you know, he supported whatever I wanted to do, but he just wanted me to have his presence there, to be able to not just talk on the phone, but to be able to sit on a bench, which is what we did. We went to, there was this park across from the, college where I was at. And we just sat on this bench. I remember for like the whole day and just talked and we, and then we ate and we laughed and he was that kind of person where, you know, he just offered to, I'm just going to fly across the country and hang out with you because you're going through a hard time. I hope to be that kind of dad. I can just feel when I read it, I was like, how would I feel if I heard that in my daughter's voice and I wanted to solve her problem and yet I know I couldn't. It was just beautiful. So thanks for sharing that. Are people looking to you for answers now more than ever? I think people are looking for answers now more than ever. And certainly I've been trying to do my part by very publicly writing about this, doing interviews about this, trying to offer suggestions and ways of taking care of what I call our psychological immune systems, because we're so focused on our physical immune systems right now. And, you know, we can do what we can to prevent the virus from infiltrating our bodies, but we have absolute control over whether we let the virus invade our minds. And I really want people to make sure that they are taking their emotional health seriously during this time. Well, let's talk about your career. You didn't start out in therapy. How did you find your way into that career? 
I took probably the most <laughs> circuitous route ever to becoming a therapist. I think it was four different careers. <laughs> uh, but but you know what? When I when I describe these careers to you, and I'll, I'll do that. They all, in retrospect, I think they seemed very different, but they all had to do with story in the human condition. And I was simply coming into story in the human condition through a different perspective. Are you a reliable narrator when you're telling me this story, or have you just forced that into a narrative that makes sense now? Yeah. You know, I write so much in the book about unreliable narrators, and my whole TED Talk is about unreliable narrators. But so I, I can't tell you whether I'm a reliable narrator or not. I can tell you this is my version of the story. Right, I get it. And I stand by it. So, you know, I graduated from college. I ended up transferring. So I was at Yale and I transferred to Stanford. I was much happier in California. And I, you know, was doing these internships in the entertainment business and during my summers. And also even up at Stanford, I was able to do one for Paramount from the Bay Area. Mm. And so I started working in the entertainment business. I started working first in film development, and then I moved over to the network television side. And I was working for NBC the year that two very big shows premiered. One was ER and one was Friends. And of course, nobody quite knew that they would become what they ultimately became. But it was very exciting. It was the Thursday night must-see TV reign uh, for NBC. And one of the things that I was doing was hanging out a lot in an actual ER while doing, quote-unquote, research for the show ER, because we had a consultant on the show who was a, an emergency room physician. And he kept saying to me, because I spent so much time there, he kept saying to me, you know, I think you like it better here than you like your day job. <laughs> and, and he told me that I should go to medical school. And I was a French literature major in college. <laughs> I said, <laughs> I said, but I was also very, very sort of, you know, I was like the girl on the math team and, and I was really sciencey, but that wasn't my major. I just really liked it. And so I said, I'm not going to leave and go to medical school. I was in my mid twenties then maybe 26, 27. And he said, you know, every time I would go there, he's like, you know what? It's really not too late. And finally, I spent so much time shadowing doctors, not just him, and really, you know, making that my hobby that I really wanted to do that. And the difference was that I think in, in Hollywood, we were making up, but when you're actually faced with the real stories, you know, because nobody comes to an emergency room because they expected something to happen. Of so people are at these inflection points. And, and there was something about that that so moved me. And so I went up back to Stanford to medical school. And when I was there, it was the beginning of what we now call managed care. And a lot of my professors were saying, the thing that you want to do, because it was very clear that I wanted to guide people through their lives. I wanted to be the physician who's really in the trenches with my patients as they go through their lives. And they were saying, that's just much harder to do. And we don't know if by the time you graduate, you're going to be able to do that. And that was really disheartening to me because, you know, this idea of these 15 minute visits, you know, not really being able to kind of have the practice you wanted to have made me wonder if I wanted to go through all of that. So at the same time that I was in medical school, I was also writing about my experiences in medical school. And so I left medical school to become a journalist. I still do that, but I did that full time for 10 years because I felt like I could tell people stories. I could write about people's stories. I could get into story in the human condition that way. And then I had a baby. And once I had a baby and I was thrilled to have a baby, I wanted a baby very much, but I also wanted adult interaction during the day. And so, you know, I was a new mom and the UPS guy would come every day and it was always <laughs> like the same UPS guy. And, and so he knew me and I would sort of detain him with conversation, you know, like, Hey, do you have kids? And how about the weather? And, right. and he just did not want to be chatting with me. And so he would kind of like back away to his big Brown truck. And eventually it got to the point where he would tiptoe to my door and gently put the packages down so that I would not run away. engage him in conversation. Right. So I knew I needed to do something else. And so I called up the dean at Stanford Medical School and I said, listen, maybe I should come back and do psychiatry because then I can, I can do what I want to do. And she said, here's the thing, you can come back, but do you really want to go through residency, internship, all of that with a baby, with a toddler? And, you know, most of what people do in psychiatry nowadays is they prescribe medication and do it and they do medication management. Why don't you get a graduate degree in clinical psychology and then you can do psychotherapy, which is what you want to do. And it was, of course, 
exactly what I wanted to do. And so I did that. And so I think I went from being a journalist who was helping people to tell their stories to being a therapist to what I really do is I help people edit their stories. I help people to take those narratives that they come in with and to see another side of the story that they're not seeing so that they can free themselves from this story that is keeping them trapped. In both of those cases, you have to be a good listener. Journalists have to ask the question that might not be so obvious. Have you been a good listener all your life? One of the things that I really learned as a journalist was how to listen and not interrupt people with questions and to let the silences linger. Because if you are talking to someone and you ask them a question, the first answer they give you, just like in therapy, the first answer they give you is their rehearsed answer. Mm -hmm. It's the most accessible answer. Mm -hmm. And if you give them that silence, they're going to have more come to the, to the surface. And then they're going to share that with you. And that's the really interesting answer. Mm -hmm. So listening is partly letting the silences linger, but it's also not just listening to the content of what somebody's saying, but listening to the emotional resonance of what they're saying. So they may be talking about whatever they're talking about, but I like to say that I'm listening for the music under the lyrics. The lyrics are the words that they're using. The music is, what is the underlying struggle or pattern that got them into this place? What else is going on here for that? And I think not just as a therapist or a journalist, but as we talk to one another, when we're listening for the music under the lyrics, we have much deeper connections with people. Yeah. You mentioned in the book that about 75% of clinicians doing therapy are women. Do you think that women are more in tune to listening for the music than, than guys are? I don't. I think that there are certain professions that have been dominated by women because they're viewed as less valuable. Hmm. And, you know, when I was in medical school, I remember that a lot of my professors, when they were going through medical school, that men were the doctors and women were the nurses Sure, because nursing wasn't considered as valuable. Now you'll see a lot more male nurses and you'll also see a lot more female physicians. So I think it has to do with what we value Mm -hmm. and people don't necessarily value talking about their lives. You know, so watch, it's like the men who are the psychiatrists, the men who are prescribing the medication, but it's the women who are sitting there having these deep, rich conversations But the men who do this, the men who are in this profession are excellent at what they do. So it's not that men can't do this. It's that I think that, you know, it's not as valued. Also people, so people who do talk therapy versus people who do, let's say, psychiatry make less money. And that's another reason, right? It's not as valued. Hey, everybody, it's Paul. I was just talking to Lori, but now I want to talk to you about something. If you're new to Crazy Money or you just haven't listened to a whole bunch of back episodes, I want to recommend one of my favorites, and that's my interview with Jonathan Rausch. He's a contributor to The Atlantic and the author of a book called The Happiness Curve, which opened my eyes to something I see in myself and in many of my contemporaries. Did you know that across cultures and even species, that happiness declines from early adulthood and bottoms out in the mid to late 40s? Why? Nobody really knows. But the good news is that happiness rebounds and increases from that point on throughout the rest of your life. Probably because you stop worrying about stuff that doesn't matter and you focus on what's important in life, spending time with people you love and who love you. Now, you should only do it once you've listened to the entire Lori Gottlieb interview, so I'm not asking you to switch over now. But when you're done with it, seek out the interview I did with Jonathan Rausch on January 21st of 2020. It's available in your Crazy Money episode feed. Now back to Lori. Gender sort of was on my mind because we were on vacation with some friends and a friend of mine saw me reading the book and I had removed the dust jacket because I didn't want to ruin it. And she said, I love that book, but why'd you remove the cover? Did you not want anyone seeing that you're reading it? Which struck me, as a, <laughs> which struck me as a question about therapy and masculinity. Do men have a harder time asking for help? Yes, I will say that. I will say, so men are just as skilled as women at being talk therapists But I will say that in our culture, we don't give men the room to be vulnerable. And I'll I'll tell you a couple of specific examples of this. One is when I'm doing couples therapy, and let's say I'm seeing a heterosexual couple, and it's a man and a woman, and the woman is saying, has been saying for weeks, I want to really, 
I want you to open up to me. I want to connect with you on this deeper level. I want you to really be vulnerable with me. I want to understand you, what's going on inside you. And then he opens up to her and maybe he starts crying. She will inevitably look at me like a deer in headlights, like, <laughs> oh my God, what do I do with this? He's crying. And if he's crying a lot, like it's not just a tear, but it's like, he's really crying. Right. Women are so uncomfortable seeing men be vulnerable in that way, even when they ask for it. So what happens is in individual therapy, generally men will come in and they'll say something like, you know, I've never told anyone this before. Mm. And then I wait to hear what they're going to say. And then what they tell me feels, it's like, really? <laughs> you know, I'm thinking in my head, you really had no one to tell that to before. It's like, it's <laughs> not that deep what they're saying. Right, right. And we'll get to the deep stuff later. But it's really interesting that that was the secret, this thing that they felt like they couldn't tell anyone, even if they have a great partner, even if they have great friends, you know, people to whom they, they theoretically could talk to. In our culture, we don't allow men to be vulnerable. So I have so much compassion for them when they say, I've never told anyone this before. And then they tell me that thing. Women will come in and they'll say, I've never told anyone this before, except for my mother, my sister, and my best friend, right? So they've, they've had like one to three people that they've been able to tell this to, but for them, it feels like they've told nobody. And then what they do tell me, you know, I can see why they felt uncomfortable maybe sharing that with people. So I would say that's a big sort of, if we make a generalization, that's a big gender difference. And so I think we need to allow the space for men to talk about things the way that we allow the space for women to talk about things. Yeah, it makes a ton of sense. And I was struck by sort of the differences in the way each of your patients in your book, which you, to cut to the book, which I told you before we started that I loved and I did love it. And I highly recommend it to my listeners. It was not only very thought provoking, it was a very entertaining read, but you walk us through the lives of a handful of your patients that span age and gender. And it is interesting the way each of them interacts with you. And one of the patients that is really compelling is a guy that we meet named John. And at first the reader thinks this this guy is an irredeemable prick. I mean, what a jerk. And you figure something else is going to come later. But in that moment, you don't know where this is going to go. How do you keep yourself from judging people too quickly? Well, first of all, I think that when people come in, they're kind of like a snapshot, right? It's like if you took a snapshot of somebody in time, that's one image of them. There are so many other snapshots that you could look at that would fill out the picture. Mm -hmm. So when someone like John comes in and he was very abrasive, very unlikable. Um, he was insulting to me on a number of levels. Yes. Um, you know, he didn't want his wife to know that he was coming to therapy. So he said he would pay me in cash. And then he said, you'll be like my mistress. And then he amended that and said, actually, you're not the kind of person I choose as my mistress. You, a- you'll be more like my hooker, <laughs> you know, and, he, and then he goes, isn't that funny? <laughs> Super funny. So, you know, I think that people's behavior, the way that they behave is often a way of communicating something that is unspeakable to them. They can't say what it is that they're holding inside. And so they keep you at a distance with their behavior. And that's what John did, not just with me, but with everybody, is he wouldn't let anybody get near him because if they got near him, if they got close to him, they might see this very tender secret that he was keeping, this very, this, this unspeakable pain that he was holding all by himself because he felt like he had to be going back to gender. He felt like he had to be the rock for his family. His family had experienced a tragedy yes. and he felt like he had to be the strong one. That if he broke down, the whole house of cards would fall down. The whole family would fall apart. And yet what his family really needed was for him to be human with them, for him to be in the trenches with them as they navigated this tragedy together. So when you're in the professional setting, that's obvious, but does that work help you be more empathetic to strangers in your everyday life? Well, let me tell you, it, it's not so obvious in the professional setting. So when John came in, you know, I imagined that there was something that was motivating this kind of extreme behavior. But at the same time, I didn't know that it would be, you know, what it actually was. I'm not going to reveal it here for people who haven't. No, read I'm book. not going to, no spoilers. Um, but I'll just say that, that, you know, you don't know what it's going to be. And I really, when, when John ended up telling me much later what it was, I was shocked. I had never expected it to be something like that. 
I expected it to be maybe something from his childhood, which of course there was something, but, but the thing that happened in his adulthood, I, I didn't see that coming at all. So as a therapist, I think you're always surprised, you know, you don't know what the story is going to be. And that's what I think is so fascinating about the work that we do is that you never know where these stories are going. And sometimes the person who's there doesn't know where their story is going either. I'm sorry, I lost your question. You had asked. I didn't mean to suggest that you always know in the therapist's chair what's going to happen. I meant to say that you're sort of, you're on your professional toes, right? As opposed to being in the parking lot at the grocery store and somebody cuts you off. Are you more empathetic to people that you just, you know, run across in daily life, (laughs) you know? Right. Um, You know, I mean, I think that I say at the beginning of the book that I'm a card carrying member of the human race. And and that's my, actually my most significant credential because I I know (laughs) what it's like to be a person in the world. And so I think when I'm out in the world, you know, I get irritated by the things that everybody gets irritated by. But I will say this, when I was training, One of my clinical supervisors said when I was an intern, she said, there's something likable in everyone. It's your job to find it. And I thought, well, that's very nice, but (laughs) I don't, I don't imagine that I will find something likable in everyone because how can you, but she was right. And I'll tell you why that if people take off the mask, you know, because the mask is like what John was doing, trying to keep me at bay with his not funny joke. If people show the truth of who they are, there is always something likable, something relatable, something that you can connect with about that person. Mm. The problem is that out the world, so many of us, all of us, we keep the mask on to some degree. And so those unlikable traits that we have, that's generally us trying to be something, trying to present ourselves in some way to be likable. But the irony is that's what makes us unlikable. Yeah. And so I think that people don't realize that. And that's why so many people keep themselves, there's a part of themselves that they keep hidden, even to people that they're very close with. You know, and I, Carl Jung called secret psychic poison. And I think that's what it does in a relationship is when you keep parts of yourself secret. And I don't mean privacy. There's a difference between privacy and secrecy. Privacy is we all need some parts of ourselves that are just for us. But when we're withholding something because of shame, that's a secret. And that's when people can't really get close to you. And also it's going to be hard for them to, to kind of, you know, find you as likable because you're hiding something, you're hiding these essential parts of yourself. The issues that your patients are grappling with run the gamut. One of your patients came to you shortly after a terminal diagnosis with cancer, and she asked you to stay with her until she dies. Now, how does one keep a, an appropriate professional distance from somebody whose issues are so incredibly personal and that is going to lead to conversations that really necessitate you to be a human being first in that chair? I think we're always a human being first in that chair. Sure. And that was one of the things I learned by going to my own therapist. So there are the four patients that you mentioned mm-hmm. um, that I follow in the book, but there's a fifth patient and the fifth patient is me <laughs> as I go to my own therapist. Right. So, you know, I think that what I learned from going to my therapist, because I was very new at the time that, so the stories that I'm telling in the book are when I was a new therapist and my therapist was very experienced. And so he always brought his humanity into the room. And I want to clarify that because I don't mean that he was, he didn't have boundaries and I don't mean that he was talking about himself or doing anything even remotely inappropriate. What I mean is that he brought his whole personality into the room. Mm -hmm. He brought his real self into the room. So whether I was seeing Julie who was dying of cancer or anybody else, I brought my whole self into the room. If I had a reaction to something they were saying, if I felt sad by something they were saying, you know, I wasn't hiding that. I was very human in the room. So with Julie, though, I was afraid to take her on because I had never been, she was in her 30s, had just come back from her honeymoon, was diagnosed with cancer. And then, you know, she was dying. And I didn't know if I would be the right person for her because I had never done that before. I had never been with somebody that young, going through a terminal diagnosis. And I wanted her to have the experience that she wanted to have. And I didn't know if I would mess it up, quite frankly, you know, would it be too hard for me? Exactly your question. Would I be able to handle the emotional toll of what that would be like? Would I be able to do justice to what the experience she wanted to be? So 
But she wanted me because I wasn't part of what she called the cancer, you know, the cancer people. She wasn't somebody who, you know, the, like the, the pink ribbons and the optimism and the affirmations, that was not the approach that was going to work for her. And so she just wanted to be sort of, you know, talk to somebody who wasn't in that world. And it was a really interesting experience because I think all of my patients make me ask questions about myself that maybe I, I wouldn't necessarily think to ask because I'm not, you know, faced with those issues every day in the way that they hold up a mirror to me when they bring their own issues to me do. So with Julie, I think she really made me think a lot about being in midlife where I was, uh, being in midlife and what is the next half of my life going to look like? And, you know, this idea of life has a hundred percent mortality rate and that's not just for other people. And, you know, how am I living my life? Am I living intentionally? And I was going through my own, a different kind of health problem mm-hmm. at the time. Um, this sort of medical mystery that, that, you know, it ended up being an autoimmune issue, but it really made me think about why do we need a terminal diagnosis to make us consider how we want to live our lives? Because Julie was really doing that. And it was, it was something that I think I've taken from the experience of, of going through you know, transitioning her from life to death was not just doing that in my own life, but also making sure that every single one of my patients is aware of his or her mortality. Because if we're not aware of it, if we're not aware of the limited time that we have, most of us just kind of skate along and we get caught up in the really trivial things and we don't really consider the big picture. And I think we all need to consider the big picture if we want to have a meaningful life. Do you see people doing that given the the current situation with the quarantine and COVID-19? I think some people are doing that. I think a lot of people, you know, I talk um, in that Atlantic piece, um, I talk a lot about the difference between productive anxiety and unproductive anxiety. And productive anxiety is the kind of worry that we need to have, like we're social distancing, we're washing our hands, we're taking the steps we need to take to make sure that we and our communities are safe. Unproductive anxiety is this excessive rumination, this futurizing, catastrophizing about things that haven't happened and may never happen. And so many of us in daily life, not just during the coronavirus, we get caught up in that rumination. And even even when we know during a crisis, like, let's think about what's important. Let's really take a step back. I think that most people are still just clicking on the headlines a lot of the day. Mm -hmm. And they're not really taking this time to reflect or, or to even just live their lives. Like here I am right now in the present and I'm cooking with my family right. and to really enjoy that instead of like, you know, ruminating about something else or being someone somewhere else in their minds instead of exactly where they are in the present. Yeah, I'm trying to look at the news in the morning and at night and no other time during the day because there's very little I can do about it. People are already doing exactly what they need to be doing and there's nothing that's going to happen and when you check every hour, right. it's going to be different from what you're doing if you check once a day. Yeah. You talk about intentional living and Julie gets a minimum wage job. She's a college professor, but she goes and gets a minimum wage job. Why did she do that? Yeah. <laughs> um, Julie made some really interesting choices about how she wanted to live her life. So she was a, she was a very successful, she just got in 10 years. She was a very successful professor and she was in the checkout line at a supermarket one day, and she was noticing that, I, I should say that, you know, we're talking about Trader Joe's because mm-hmm. it's a very specific kind of culture there. Yes, yes. And they would like ring bells, you know, <laughs> they would like give balloons out to kids. They were, you know, they, they seemed like they were having a lot of fun to Julie. And Julie thought, these people are making the people happy who are checking out, like you might be in a bad mood when you're standing in line, but then they talk to the cashier and the cashier would cheer them up. The cashier would engage them in conversation. The cashier was doing something very tangible in the moment to make somebody's day better. And Julie said, I want to do that. I want to have those interactions, even if they last, you know, 60 seconds. I want to have those connections with people. I want to get a job at Trader Joe's. And her husband, you know, she was newly married and her husband said, wait a minute, you are dying. And this is how you want to spend your time being a cashier at Trader Joe's. And what about spending time with me? What about spending time with with your friends, your family? What about relaxing? What about doing all the things on your bucket list? And she said, I I really want to just be 
centered in the present. This is what I want to do. And so as a therapist, you try not to, you don't want to make decisions for other people. You want to let them make their own decisions. And you have to be very careful about that. And this was one time when I really wanted to kind of say to her what her husband said to her, like, are, are you sure you want to do this? Mm-hmm. But I really wanted her to do things the way she wanted to do them. And it was fantastic for her. She ended up, you know, being a part of this community and she made a very good friend there. And this very good friend ended up at one point before she had a terminal diagnosis, when she was just had a cancer diagnosis and they thought she was going to get better, was going to be her surrogate to have a baby. I mean, it was these relationships that she made there were very important to her. And I think that one thing that it shows is that you never know what you're going to do in a situation until you're actually in that situation. And people surprise themselves all the time. And I see that in therapy, not just when people have a terminal diagnosis, but all the time when somebody is in a situation they didn't expect to be in, maybe they're getting a divorce, maybe they're a new parent, maybe they're you know, experiencing some, some relational plot twist that they didn't expect. They surprise themselves all the time. And I think that that, you know, I think that's so heroic to see people do things they never thought they would do to take risks they never thought they would take, even if it looks crazy to the outside world. Well, one of the things that struck me was that there's a real social benefit to certain kinds of work that the interaction she has with colleagues and customers in that situation is the kind of human connection that that I missed when I left work. I left work at 42 and started writing by myself and spending all day by myself. And I was like, I miss my friends. Why am I lonely? And so when she starts talking about the environment at Trader Joe's, I'm like, that makes sense. It's such an interesting insight that she had that she wanted that before she died. I was kind of yeah. blown away by it. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a, there's a scene in the book where, uh, that I write about where I was at Trader Joe's with my son mm-hmm. and I didn't know that Julie worked at that Trader Joe's. I'd never seen her there. There are a million Trader Joe's. I'm in a big metropolitan area. And also Julie didn't live near me. So it, was counterintuitive that you know, I was never expecting to see her there. And I'm there. And all of a sudden my son points her out, you know, having no idea that she's my patient. Mm-hmm. Just he's like, look at that lady. <laughs> Cause she was having so much fun with, with everybody in the line. And he wanted to go in her line. And I did not want to go in that line because I, you know, want to make sure that she would not be uncomfortable with me, you know, seeing me outside of the therapy office. And then she calls me into the line. And I had the experience of, going through her line. And my son had that experience and it was really moving to see, you know, there was so, you know, as she was dying, she, she, there was this like vivacity, this, this aliveness about her that, that you could feel that was palpable. And so the experience with Julie, I hope the reader can feel because I think that it will make them feel more alive too, just reading about the experience. It was very effective as a reader. I'll attest to that. This show is mostly about money and careers and values and understanding what we want from money and why we want what we want from money. And there's this point with John where he's talking about his success and he's had very meaningful success in the entertainment business, like 0.1% success, it sounds like. And he says something to the effect of, now they can't take any of this away from me. Yeah. And by them, they, he means the people in his past who had doubted him or the medical school admissions teams who didn't admit him when he applied twice. Like he spent all this effort and all this time trying to prove something to somebody else. Do you see that syndrome a lot in your work? I do. I do. Especially, I see a lot of people like John who they're very successful professionally and yet they feel like they have a score to settle. It's never enough. And, you know, there's always something that they haven't done. There's always someone else who's more successful. There's someone that they're envious of. And then they're ashamed of their envy. And I always tell people about any feeling, but, you know, with envy too, I say, follow your envy. It tells you what you want. So if you're looking at that person, you're envious of them. What is it that they have that you want? And are you sure that the thing you think you want is the part that you're envious of. Because often what happens is someone will see someone who's maybe you know successful in a certain way, but what that person seems to have is they seem to have maybe the family that the person wants, or they have um, a sense of wholeness about them. 
you know, there are other aspects of what they have. It's because th- th- these people tend to be successful too. So it's not that they don't have that already. I think for John, you know, there was so much of a feeling unseen in his, you know, when he was growing up, so much of feeling like people did not did not see who he was or, or what he was capable of. And so he spent his whole adulthood trying to show people what he was capable of. And yet to the outside world, he was, you know, people were envious of him. He was so highly successful, but he never felt like it was enough because he kept trying to prove something to, and I asked him, who's they? Right, right, <laughs> Who is right. they? This guy, know, he won. Have- He's already won, dude. Yeah, yeah, well, right. But, but he hadn't won because- he didn't feel like he was seen by in, in a certain way by the people he wanted to be seen by. Right. And, and part of the reason that he wasn't seen is because he wouldn't let people see them, mm. you know, as an adult. So a lot of times it happens is we have something happen as a child or we have some experience as a child. And then we carry that into adulthood, even though it doesn't fit anymore. It's like, it's like old clothes that don't fit anymore. You're still wearing those clothes, <laughs> right, right. but they don't fit. Take them off. Yeah. So we go around and we carry that with us and we replicate that situation with every other person in our adult lives, even though it's not applicable to those relationships in our adult lives. We just think it is. You mentioned the syndrome, if the queen had balls, she'd be the king. As if, if we attain something we don't currently have, we'd be perfectly fulfilled and completed human beings. What are those things people think will make them happy? Right. Well, that's like so many people will come in and they feel trapped and they'll say something like, you know, I can't have this because X, I can't have this because Y. And it's because the scenario that they, they say they can't have is a really good scenario, but it's not perfect. It's sort of like the perfect is the enemy of the good. And so, but I think what they're really doing is they're perpetuating a story of being trapped. And and one thing that my therapist said to me was, you know, at a certain point, because I was perpetuating that story in my own life. Mm -hmm. So many of us feel like, you know, the reason that we can't change, the reason that we can't have what we want is because of someone or something out there. We don't realize that our role in this story is what's holding us back. And I don't mean that there aren't circumstances out there that hold us back. In fact, when I was training, a supervisor once said, before diagnosing someone with depression, make sure they aren't surrounded by assholes. (laughs) <laughs> so, right. So, so it's like, yes, there are people out there who might be getting in uh, our ways, but what is our response to those assholes? What is our response to the situation? How are we keeping ourselves trapped? So my therapist said, you remind me of this cartoon and it's of a prisoner shaking the bars, desperately trying to get out. But on the right and the left, the bars are open no bars, right? So yeah. all we have to do, all the prisoner has to do is walk around the bars. The question is, why don't we? Why don't we walk around the bars? And that's because sometimes we don't want freedom because with freedom comes responsibility. And if we are responsible for our own lives, then we can't blame everything out there, everyone out there, right? Yep. So I think that when people present with these scenarios of like, I can't do this because of X or I can't do that because of Y, they don't want to look at the fact that the bars are open. There are no bars on the side. Yeah, You can walk around them. You just don't want to make the changes that you are going to have to make. You don't want to put in the effort or the work that you are going to have to put in to make that thing happen if you walk around those bars. Yeah. Along those lines, early in your career, you, and we talked a little bit about this, but early in your career, you were having success as a talent agent, but you just found yourself thinking, I don't care. What advice would you give for someone potentially who is well further along in their career, probably making a lot more money than you are, who's hearing those voice, but feels stuck in their work? Yeah. I wasn't a talent agent. I was a, dev- I was a network executive. Sorry. Um, okay. Right. You were yeah. development at um, NBC at the time when you were. Stuck yeah. In that. I think that for me, I looked at people who were, you know, farther along than I was. And, and I just said, I don't want to be doing that. <laughs> and, 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 and I think even though they had all of the things that I think were, you know, when you're in your twenties, I think are very appealing, which is they had prestige, they had respect, they had money, they had all of those things. And I just looked at the day to day of that. And I said, is that the life that I want to live? I'm not I'm not engaged in this. I don't feel passionate about this. And I think that you have to feel passionate about what you do every day. It has to have meaning for you. And so it's not just passion like I like it. It's passion as in this is meaningful. Even the way that Trader Joe's was meaningful to Julie, where she was like, this is meaningful what I'm doing here. Now, you know, if she weren't dying, would she have chosen that? Probably not. But I think that, you know, 
first of all, we're all dying, right? And so you have to say what is meaningful. So the reason that I think what I'm doing right now is so meaningful to me is that it combines all of the things that have always mattered to me, which is, you know, what are people's stories? What is the human condition like? How do we grow and change? What holds us back? I've always been interested in those questions. And I've always been interested in the in sort of the connection. And I think the connection that I make as a therapist with the people that I see, they're profound connections. Even if, you know, most people, you know, they leave and you never see them again. Those connections have changed me as a person and they've changed them. And so even if we're not seeing each other, you know, we still live inside each other in that way. Right. Yeah. I haven't been to therapy, quote unquote. I have had a few life coaches, however, who've had big impacts on my life. And it certainly is a very personal, intense kind of connection. Let me read you something that my friend Rebecca from New York City, who is a psychotherapist as well, wrote. I'm grateful to Lori that she portrayed our work in a way that feels realistic rather than those dumb stereotypes that have been all over the media. The relationships she describes with her patients have such depth and the way she works really resonates with me. So not only are you building those relationships with your patients, but your, but your colleagues out there like what you're doing as well. Well, you know what, we're doing a, um, we're doing a TV series of the book. And one of the things that Rebecca talks about there is something that has been so important to me, which is that I keep, you know, talking about that. This is a show not about therapists. You know, it's a show about people who happen to be therapists. And I think there's a big difference because it's a show about human beings. Like, yes, they happen to be therapists, but it's not the cliches, you know, your your friend was talking about, like the cliches that people have around what therapists are like and who they are. And I think there are these two tropes in the media about therapists. One is kind of the the brick wall, you know, the, the blank slate, the brick wall, the person who's like a robot. That's one trope. And the other trope is like, what you saw in in treatment, you know, the, the hot mess, the person who's like, <laughs> you know, crossing boundaries, having sex with their patients, whatever. It's like neither of those. It's good TV. It's good TV. But you know what? I think good TV is showing something that people can say, yeah, that's me. Mm. Right. That's good TV. So it's not about being provocative or sensational. It's about showing people as they really are. And I think that the best shows, the shows that I have always loved the most are about, people as they are, where people can see themselves in the characters' stories. I don't know if you know the show, The Americans. Oh um, yeah, I loved it. Well, those are the people who are writing this show oh, of cool. maybe you should talk to someone. Mm. And, you know, I think what they do so well is they, they're they so subtle in terms of how they portray relationships and, you know, sort of what's going on under under the hood, as I like to say. So it's really exciting as they just recently sent me a first draft and they very much want it to be accurate. They're like, what would happen in this situation? Or what would a therapist say in this situation? Not to spoil too much, but the show centers around four people and two of them happen to be married to each other. And they're saying, you know, well, what, like, what, what would this conversation look like at home? You know, so I, I think that's really important. So interesting how your former career is now wrapping itself back into your current career. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that, you know, one of the things that I've really appreciated in the response to the book has been how many people are now talking about their inner lives in a different way. And I don't mean in some woo woo way. And I don't mean that, you know, all of a sudden people are like sitting there going, I feel because that's not what people do in the book either. But I think that people are just really trying to reach deeper into themselves to have more meaningful lives and to have more meaningful relationships with other people. And so a book reaches people at a certain level, right? And a lot of people have read this book, which is great. But I think that TV reaches even more people. And I'm so glad that we're bringing this to television because I think that it just helps to enrich people's lives and and take away that stigma and all of the stereotypes around what it means to, to be fully human and to show up with each other. Do you know when the series will come out? I don't know. I would guess in the next year, but I don't know exactly. Okay. Lori, thank you so much for your time. I really enjoyed your book. It was very thought provoking and it made me feel much more grateful for all the good things that are going on in my life. So it was a fun read and a pleasure to talk to you. Uh, well, thanks so much for the conversation. I really appreciate it. Where can our listeners find out more about you? They can go to my website, which is lauriegottlieb.com. They can read my Dear Therapist column in The Atlantic, which comes out every Monday. Soon they'll be able to listen to my new podcast that Katie Kirk is producing with iHeartRadio called Dear Therapists. 
They can follow me on Twitter at Lori Gottlieb one. They can see me on Instagram, which I'm just trying to figure out how to use at Lori Gottlieb underscore author. They can watch my Ted talk about unreliable narrators. Lori, thank you again so much for your time. It was great to talk to you. Oh, thanks so much. Thank you, Lori. I really appreciate you taking time to join us today. I cannot wait to see, maybe you should talk to someone on the television. I look forward to that. Hey folks, as I mentioned earlier, if you're new to the show or you haven't checked out a lot of our back episodes, I strongly encourage you to do so because there's some darn good guests that maybe you missed. I've had authors like Ryan Holiday and AJ Jacobs and Bill Browder, whose book Red Notice is just fascinating, incredible read. And I know you'll enjoy their insights into money and careers and stuff. I've had, uh, oh, Heisman Trophy winner, Danny Warfel. I've had a Nobel Prize winning economist, Sir Angus Deaton who's done some pretty important and groundbreaking work in the world of uh, money and happiness. So go back, check them out. Also, if you have a moment, sure would appreciate it if you take a time to rate and review the podcast on whatever app you listen to your podcast on, whether it's iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Pandora, Stitcher, et cetera. I sure would appreciate you taking the time to endorse it to the other folks who are looking for great quality podcasts on those apps. And lastly, please be kind to yourself and to those around you during this quarantine. It is a great time to remember how important it is to value yourself and each other. So stay the course, stay gold. Mike Carano, make me sound smart.